R. Crosby and Lyles, and this is News from the Can. You know, my channel has been, uh, I've gone back and forth between politics, humor, surrounding politics, and science. And um, in the future, our channel will probably be focused more on science and the pressing concern of runaway methane being released in the Arctic. To me, that is the overwhelming issue facing humanity at this particular time, and all politics is subjugated to that. Unless we're talking about survival at this point, then everything else is um, moat. Frankly, uh, I'm tired of laughing at the buffoons in politics who ignore the pressing issues of the day I'm tired of the football going back and forth and the fighting going around and round and nothing ever getting accomplished. So I don't think that there's anything that I can say or do, and there's no amount of joking and poking fun of it that will help. I did this for a reason. I am angry. Democracy cannot work if the news media will not, will not, will not report any fact However obviously true, however obviously interesting, if that fact happens to go against the Climate Communist Party line. The okay, did you get that? The Climate Communist Party line. So <laughs> that doesn't tell you where the cat's coming from. I don't know what, but this, this video's got 347,625 views. Uh, likes and dislikes kind of split there. Obviously, the coal, oil, and carbon industry, energy sector industry, would like for us to believe that global warming is not a big issue. And of course, Guy McPherson, some have complained that the problem with Guy McPherson is that he's actually sort of um, a climate denier on steroids because he's basically saying, well, we're doomed anyway. Coffee and Belize and the end of the world with Guy McPherson. Basically, he, he said in this video here, if we stop everything, then it's worse. It's just, it's far too late. It's gone way past the point of actually being, doing anything to change it now. Civilization itself, this set of living arrangements that we sort of take for granted, that itself is a heat engine. Hmm. The civilization itself, whether we power it by solar panels and wind turbines or with fossil fuels, it's a heat engine. And this has been validated now by several papers in the very conservative referee journal literature. So so we can either keep this thing going or we can shut it all down. And as it turns out, if we shut it all down, the absence of global dimming or the so-called aerosol effect, when all the sulfates and the particulates fall out of the sky that are reflecting sunlight back up before it gets to Earth, we achieve a very, very rapid rise in temperature in a very short period of time. We're talking... Um, an additional three degrees or so Celsius global average temperature rise in a few days or weeks. And, it, you know, I don't, I don't see any way for humans to survive that. So we can either keep, keep the omnicidal heat engine of civilization going and keep driving to extinction at 150 to 200 species a day, or we can turn it off and drive ourselves and those other species to extinction even faster. Pick your poison. It's all poison. <laughs> It'll be worse. And here he is, Guy McPherson, knocking back a few drinks there. He's, he's living in Belize now. I'm like, dude, you know, if you're really concerned about this runaway methane scenario and the earth cooking, why would you move closer to the equator in Belize? Hey, maybe he's getting paid. I don't know. Who knows? Uh, I, I can only speculate about that. But here's a couple of issues, right, about the whole thing. Um when I see this right here, Arctic Death Spiral, and it's only got 22,000 views. Listen to this guy. There have been changes in the Arctic, in the permafrost, in terms of the temperature over time, not only 
in the shallow layers near the surface, but at 10, 20, and 50 meter depths, you're seeing changes that are even more rapid. That indicates that not only is there heating near the surface, but that this heat is being transported to depth. Let's go back here for a second. When I see someone from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory talking, I listen. And what he just said about depth. In the shallow layers near the surface, but at 10, 20, and 50 meter depths, you're seeing changes that are even more rapid. That indicates that not only is there heating near the surface, but that this heat is being transported to depth very efficiently. So. Um, this is the permafrost. Uh, stores methane, as Richard was talking about, it's currently melting. It's warmer up there. It's like five degrees warmer up in the Arctic than it is. The average temperature of the world is only up a degree, but up in the Arctic, it's up five degrees. And, and it's uh, releasing 50 million tons per year, which is a, ton, a billion tons of CO2. And it's obviously rising. If it all went, we'd basically all be dead. I mean, and... Okay, now, now let, let, let's get to this point here. This is an important point. If it all went, and this is Wikipedia, kill me, what, what can I tell you? Um, they kind of get into depth here a little bit. See estimate for other natural gas sources. The permafrost reservoir has been estimated at about 400 gigatons of carbon in the Arctic. But no estimates have been made of possible Antarctic reservoirs. These are larger amounts in comparison. The total carbon in the atmosphere is around 800 gigatons. In comparison, the total carbon in the atmosphere is around 800 gigatons. Okay, we can argue about all these sources and things like that. So we're talking 400 gigatons in the Arctic. He says if it all goes, all 400 gigatons... Is he talking about, and you keep hearing about gigaton releases and things like that. Let's go to the Permian anoxia high temperature double whammy during Permian Triassic marine crisis and its aftermath. So basically what this is is, is that there was a double whammy between acidification, uh, here you got H2S, and methane. The ocean becoming lethally hot at the top and then anoxic refuge zones is what it's called, a refuge zone in between where it was lethally hot on top and anoxic below that. Guy McPherson, he's always talking about the great dying. He's always referencing the great dying. Well, okay. Earth's greatest killer finally caught. MIT News, here you go. Uh, Jennifer Chu, Siberian traps likely culprit for in Permian extinction. The guy was able to go and, and nail down the lava flows, the basalt lava flows that were responsible for supposedly releasing the greenhouse gases and so forth that were responsible for the Permian extinction. The work that the doctoral students were able to do pretty much penned it down that that's your likely killer, your, the likely cause. And you can see that here, life science, Earth's greatest killer finally caught. It basically backs up all that and it even goes into further discussion about um, the ways and means. But what's really important to realize is that this volcanic eruption that they're talking about that caused the Permian-Triassic extinction would make Yellowstone look like a firecracker. It was the largest volcanic eruption the Earth has ever seen, and they think that it might have been because of a hit from a meteorite on the antipodal side of the planet, on the opposite side of where the Siberian traps are. Traps as refers to steps. So this volcano spewed out between one to four million cubic kilometers of basaltic material. That translates into just one year's worth of volcanism from the Siberian traps, or about 57 cubic miles miles of lava could generate 1.46 billion tons of sulfur dioxide and devastate the northern hemisphere. They go on to say that uh, the entire, here we go, in total, more than 1.2, this is 1 point, uh, it's okay, they say 1,200 billion tons, which is 1.2 trillion tons of methane and 4 trillion tons of sulfur dioxide could have emerged from the Siberian Traps eruption. So, gee, goddamn whiz, man. Of course the fucking ocean is going to, you know, of course you're going to have an, uh, the ocean is going to become anoxic. You know, the whole entire ocean, they said, was like the, the acidity of a freaking uh, lemon or something. 
you know, and it's like Jesus Christ, of course. But here's the other, here's, here's kind of sort of the upshot of that. It was the great dying. However, 96% of the species of the ocean died out, and 70% of terrestrial life died out. But that's only 70%. 30% of that life survived. 30, so 30% so 30 of the terrestrial life survived through 1.2 trillion tons of methane being released and 4 trillion tons of sulfur dioxide being released. And 30% of terrestrial life survived to the point that following this we had the Jurassic. We had Jurassic Park, you know. So life bounced back after all that. So my point is that, yeah, um, of course it's bad news. Um, no question about it. We're talking about a reservoir size, 400 gigatons. And, you know, you keep hearing gigaton, a gigaton release. Well, if there's 800 gigatons of, of carbon in the, in the atmosphere as it is, we know Okay, I'm not gonna, this is not an argument against. We know it's clear, clearly. When you see this guy right here, Dr. Charles Miller at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I mean, they don't hire idiots. So I'm just saying, when I hear from these guys that it's going on, dude, it's going on. And to me, there it is. You know, we know, so it's known. The methane feedback loop is ongoing. This is known. You know, is humanity going to be an extinct in 10 years? We didn't just survive because of, our, because of the size of our brains. It just so happens that Homo sapiens, human beings, are also very efficient. That for the amount of food that we consume, we, we use that food very efficiently. We're one of the most efficient animals on the planet in terms of our caloric intake and how efficiently we use it. Human beings are survivors. It'll be us, the rats, and the cockroaches, pretty much. So, with all the fucking hell, I mean, dude, 1.2 trillion tons of methane and 4 trillion tons of sulfur, 4 trillion tons of sulfur dioxide being released, and 30% of the species survived. It sucked, no doubt about it. And what we're going to go through with this methane feedback is going to suck. No doubt about it. People are going to die. No doubt about it. We already know that 20 million people are going to, you know, four famines mean 20 million may starve. This is ongoing. This is not conjecture. This is happening. We already know that it's happening. So it's going to suck. But how you can possibly say that this is a human being extinction event... There's just not enough, you know, according to the data that I've seen, that we're looking at right here, um, there's just not enough carbon. The, red, the size of the reservoir, the Arctic Reservoir, 400 gigatons. There's 800 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere as it is um, right now as we speak. In 2008, research on Antarctic Vostok and Epicodome C ice cores revealed that methane clathrates were also present in deep Antarctic ice cores and record a history of atmospheric methane concentrations dating to 800,000 years ago. The ice core methane clathate record is a primary source of data for global warming research along with oxygen and carbon dioxide. So here's a very important point about that. You have methane gas that was in the atmosphere at one time being frozen turned into methane clathrate in the atmosphere which it then falls out of the sky as frozen precipitation onto antarctica where it thousands of years later ends up in an antarctic ice core okay so that's very important so just because we have methane in the air doesn't necessarily rule out that where we might have an ice age the two concepts are not mutually exclusive. There's a level of complexity here that cannot be understated. Transport of water vapor from the equator to the poles, which is illustrated in this right here, Stopping the Coming Ice Age by Larry Efron and Andy Caffrey. Ice Age documentary that came out in 1988, and basically it's about this cat here, John D. Hamaker. 
but he basically says that global warming is what causes ice ages. At the end of every interglacial period, you have a period of global warming, and that period of global warming is followed by an ice age. And I would go on to say that at the end of that global warming period, you have a methane feedback loop of some kind. But in any case, I wanted to just throw that in there, the two, these two ideas here that, um, you know, there are for a long time now since, you know, the 80s. And this is the John D. Hammaker thing. That yeah, was back in the, the guys had this these theories since maybe the 60s, I think, or the, the at least the 70s, proposed that, you know, um, global warming is a, is a precursor to uh, the to a coming ice age. So this is the, these ideas have been around for a while, and of course they were picked up by Art Bell and Whitley Strieber, you know, uh, if you can imagine that, and which of course turned into the day after tomorrow, uh, which uh, I guess not everybody is, you know, is together with that. But in any case, I wanted to get to that, and also wanted to mention that you know, um, methane clathrate has come in the form of frozen precipitation, which is important because it says that if you know you can have quantities of methane in the atmosphere and then it can fall out of the sky in the form of frozen precipitation that's important you know so it's not you know having methane in the air is not does not mutually exclude the idea of uh, an ice age and that's all i wanted to say on this particular thing news from the can